I want us to think about this, you know, and here even with the, the shooting in Charleston, I just think that we keep finding ourselves in the same problems over and over again. Here we are, you know, we have another uh, apparently race-related shooting here in America. And we just think not too long ago when this kind of thing happened again, and we wonder why do we keep going through the same cycle over and over again? And it's not just a cycle in our country, it's a cycle in our own lives, a cycle in our own hearts. The problem with this country is that it's filled with people. <laughs> and, uh, and we're people, and so we should understand that this cycle of going back to the same thing over and over again isn't something our, is unique to our country, it's, a unique, it's not unique at all. It's, we find it in every single one of our own hearts. No matter how harmful something is, we always seem to go back to what we know. We always go back to what we're comfortable with, what our past was. Uh, we have a tendency to just go back to the same things. Why is that? Why is that? Even if it's something harmful, uh, just because we, we're comfortable with it or we, it, it's, it's a part of our past, we want to go back to it. We find ourselves going back to it again and again. We have a, I was thinking about this, we, we have in, in the upcoming presidential elections here in the country, we're going to have a, a Clinton and a Bush running against each other. I think, <laughs> when I was growing up, there was a Clinton and a Bush running against each other. What do we, you know, we're, in, and I'm not saying anything political here, but here we are again, and it seems like in the same cycle over and over again. I saw something on Facebook that said that there's, a, there's a Jurassic Park movie in the theaters right now. There's a Bush and a Clinton running against each other. There's a Terminator movie coming out. I mean, this... <laughs> You could have said the same thing to me back in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, are, we, are we not progressing? We're just going in the same circle over and over again. Um, but we always seem to go with what we know. We always go with what we know because it's comfortable to us. Um, and, and even if it's harmful, it's still comfortable to us. And that comfort uh, will always bring us back to the same battles over and over and over again. Um, there's a, something that psycho psychologists will call the cycle of abuse that they found that people, uh, people in abusive relationships will tend to go back over and over again and, uh, the, and then the abuse will happen again and they'll apologize and there'll be reconciliation. And there's a cycle of abuse that they notice takes place. This is from Psychology Today. I want to read this to you. It says, Most experts believe that children who are raised in abusive homes learn that violence is an effective way to resolve conflicts and problems. They may say they will never do what their own parents did, but many will end up replicating the same violence that they witnessed as children in their adult relationships and their own parenting experiences. Boys who witness their mother's abuse are more likely to batter their female partners as adults than boys raised in nonviolent homes. For girls, adolescence may result in the belief that threats and violence are the norm in relationships. And so we see this cycle happening even over generations. If this is something you were raised in, even if it's something unhealthy, it's something you're going to tend to gravitate toward, gravitate to, even as you grow up. This is a problem with all of us. And here's how it impacts us today. Here's how I want us to think about this today. That God has a new life for you, but our old life will always be calling and waiting for us back in the, in, in the back rooms. God has a new life for you. He's calling you to something new, but your old life is still there calling and waiting for you to come back. And maybe it's a cycle you've been through before. Maybe you're familiar with this. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I sense that some of you do. Um, that even if you've called on God and, 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 and tried to follow his ways in the new life, you, maybe you've cleaned yourself up for a bit, you know that there's a history in your life that, well, it's only a matter of time before I fall back in those same things. And you can sense your old life sitting back there and saying, okay, clean yourself up a bit. Go ahead, but I'll be waiting. I know you're going to come back to me. Maybe you think, well, you know, I don't really have that problem because my old life wasn't so bad. You know, God's calling me to new, a new life, but my old life wasn't so bad. Well, whoever you are, wherever you, maybe you were raised in the church, um, God has something new for you. Um, there's, there's no one who God says, who looks at and says, um, hey, come follow me, I got your new life, uh, but you know what, your old life was okay, so you're, you're, you're pretty good, you're okay. There, there's no one like that. So don't sit here and think, oh, I was raised in the church, I'm pretty good, I don't really have that old life that I deal with. No, God's calling you someplace new, no matter who you are. Um, God doesn't uh, call you and then say, uh, I've got something for you, but just, you know what, just stay there, you're all right. Um, but the problem is, how do we break this cycle? If God's calling us to a new life, but we find we still 
go back to gravity. We always go back to what we know. How do we break this? Experts, uh, psychological, you know, secular experts will talk about it like it's a pendulum. That we can, we can break it for a little bit, but then the pendulum will inevitably swing back. And it's only a matter of time before we fall back in the same things. There's an old saying that says, um, I don't know if you heard this saying, but uh, I wrote it down. Give me, give me the child until he is seven, and I'll show you the man. Have you ever heard this? Give me the child until he's seven, and I'll show you the man. What it's saying is, um, after seven years old, you can see what a person will be like. No matter what happens in their life, um, up to, if you see them at seven, you're going to see who they are as an adult. It's an old saying. And it's a discouraging saying because it feels like, well, do we have any power then? Do we have any control? Can we even change? Uh, we talk about this cycle of abuse, this pendulum that goes back. I mean, really, I'm older than seven. Am I just stuck with who I am as a seven-year-old? What are we going to do about this? The Israelites, as we walk through with them uh, out of the out of Egypt through the book of Exodus, the Israelites, uh, in our point in the story, have been rescued. They've been taken out of Egypt, and now they're uh, they're at the mountain uh, in the section we're at. We're at uh, Exodus chapter thirty-two today, and. Here on the mountain, Moses has left them, and he says, I'm going to go, I'm going to meet with God, and God's giving Moses the Ten Commandments. You've all seen the movie, maybe. If you, I don't know. I've seen the movie. Um, and God's up talking with Moses, and he's writing the Ten Commandments down. And meanwhile, the Israelites are waiting. They've been waiting for quite a while. They've been waiting for 40 days. And the Israelites get this brilliant idea that, uh, you know, we ought, to, we ought to make a golden calf, and we ought to start <laughs> worshiping this golden calf. Moses has been gone for a while. We've got to do, I don't know, we're bored. We've got to do something. And so here we are in this section, and I want to read it to you. It's Exodus 32, verse 1 through 6, and it's in your insert there if you want to follow along. It says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. This is Moses' brother now. And they said to Aaron, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we, we don't know what happened to him. Aaron answered them, well, take off your gold earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then he said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So here are the Israelites. Now God has rescued them out of Egypt. He's brought them across the Red Sea. He's, he's demonstrated his power in all the plagues. Uh, they got to the desert. The Israelites complained that there's no food in the desert. God has fed them. Uh, God has taken care of them. He, gives the, he takes them to the mountain he can, so God can uh, show what his laws are and how he wants them to live. And these guys get this brilliant idea. You know what we ought to do? We ought to make a calf and worship it. That's the first thing that apparently comes to their mind. Well, maybe not the first thing because Moses has been gone for a while. Uh, he's been gone for 40 days. So maybe, maybe they started out okay, but they started getting antsy. You see, you see there it says, uh, we don't know what happened to this guy Moses. We've got to worship something. We've we, we, we got to worship something. So let's make this, uh, <laughs> let's make this calf here. Now, you wonder, why a, why a cow? You know, what's, what's up with these guys making a cow? I mean, if, if, we, if we got together and we're stuck in a place for 40 days, you know, say this church was barred off for 40 days and we're sitting here and we've got we to manage for 40 days. I don't know if any one of us would say, hey, you know what we ought to do? We ought to make a cow and, and worship it. <laughs> we may be thinking, I'd like to have an actual cow to eat, but uh, what's up with this cow thing? Um, Here's why they wanted to worship a cow. The Israelites, uh, for hundreds of years, had been living in Egypt. Um, and for the last few generations, they had been living as slaves in Egypt. Now, the Egyptian uh, religion worshipped cows. They worshipped these idols. And um, this, uh, the, uh, the Israelites' desire to make a cow was simply um, that they wanted to worship. So they wanted to have a church service. And for them... They just remembered what it was like in Egypt. They saw that the gods that the Egypt, Egyptians worshipped, they saw these idols and the, the cows, and they said, well, let's do that. That was fun. We'll, you know, 
they thought church was fun, apparently. And they said, well, let's, let's have a church service and we'll do it the way we just, we'll do it the way we know how to do it. God's calling us to something else, but this is what we know. We know idol worship. We know golden calves. That's what we know. So let's do that. So here God's trying to call them to something new, but instead the Israelites want to go back to just what they know, idol worship. Even though their time in Egypt was miserable, even though they were living as slaves, um, they still want to go back to what they know, go back to what they're comfortable with, and they're comfortable with golden calves. That's something that they understand. And so they try to, they make this golden calf, and they try to mix it uh, with the new life that God has called them to. God has called them to this new life, and they say, well, that's nice, but we'll still, we'll worship this calf. And listen to what it says. It says, um, Aaron took uh, the gold, fashioned it into the shape of a calf with a tool. He said, these are your gods. And then he says, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. And he uses the name of the Lord. He uses Yahweh. Tomorrow there will be a festival to Yahweh. And this is how we'll worship him, with these golden calves. So they, they, they're trying to mix this new life that God is calling them to back with their old life. They're trying to mix it up and pretend like it's okay. Yeah, this is true worship. We're going to call it worship to Yahweh, and we're going to do it the same old way we've always done. And that's the same thing that we do. We always go back to what we know. We always go to what we know. I should have put that in your insert, a little fancy preacher saying. We always go to what we know, whether it's right or what was wrong. And then sometimes what we do is we call it worship. You know, God's calling us to something new. We still continue in our old life, and we say, yeah, this is my new life now. Same old thing as the old life. Um, that's just our human nature. It's what happens after God calls us to a new life. I put there in your insert, our old life will always tempt us. Go back to what makes you comfortable. That's what our, our old life is waiting in the wings. Go back to what makes you comfortable. Like I said, if God calls you, he's going to call you to someplace new. He doesn't call you just to say, hey, you're doing okay, stay there. <laughs> he, if he calls you, he's calling you someplace new. But we're creatures of habit, even if, even if the habit's hurt us. We're, if we're, this is why marriage is so hard for, I think, men in particular. Uh, we get used to taking care of ourselves and doing our own thing, then all of a sudden we get married and we find there's a new life where we're supposed to be living, but we're creatures of habit and we just want to do the same old thing. But you can't have a marriage, you can't have a new life and just keep living that same old life. You can try, um, but I don't know I, if you, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. It doesn't work out. Um, when, we, when we're first married, you know, me growing up, we, uh, uh, you know, holidays, birthdays, Father's Days, nothing, this was not a big deal in our house at all. It was like, happy birthday, Chad. Oh, thanks. Here, here's a cupcake. Okay. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't maybe that extreme, but it was kind of. It wasn't a big deal. And now my wife, when she was growing up, oh my goodness, birthdays, huge celebrations, get everybody you know, celebrate that you're another year older. Uh, they would celebrate half birthdays. You guys ever heard of half birthdays? Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, that's a, maybe that's the right thing to do, and maybe I'm the crazy one. But anyway, uh, so here's my wife growing up, and just every holiday is a huge celebration. And here's me growing up, and holidays are uh, was it Father's Day the other day? Yeah, I think it was. Oh, uh, and now we come together. Now what happens? <laughs> Here's me li in trying to live my same old life, and I can remember this actually pretty specifically uh, because it was a shock to me. Uh, it, it, was our, it was our Mother's Day, and uh, we had just given birth to our first daughter. Uh, we, I didn't do anything. Uh, my wife had given birth to our first daughter, and, uh, and then like a month later, it was Mother's Day. And and I just, I saw on the calendar something Mother's Day, and I was like, oh, hey, it's Mother's Day, and you're a mother. Isn't that funny? Now you're a mother. Happy Mother's Day. And I go on my own life, you know. And uh, this was the worst, like, insult I could have ever given to my wife. But I, I had no idea. And, and I found out how, how terrible it was later that day. Or it was the next day. Once Krista realized that was it, <laughs> I was in big trouble the next day. Uh, she kept waiting that one day. But, um... Now, this has been a perennial, it, this has been an issue with us uh, just constantly. Why? Because I just go back to what I know. And here it is, Father's Day, you know, and just in my own, my upbringing, my own thing, my own way of living, I just go back to, you know, you're lucky if I remember it's Father's Day kind of thing. Uh, but I go back to what I'm comfortable with. But I need uh, something new. I, I need to change that. Otherwise, things don't work out. Um, I realized 
very quickly on, uh-oh, <laughs> I need a different way of doing things now. And our comforts, our, our old lives, the, the, way we were used to, the way we used to live, that can be an idol. I want you to think this idol of the Israelites is, the idol, you know, we're not tempted to fashion a, a calf of gold, but it's a symbol of our old life, our old comforts, the things we're used to. And those things can become an idol. If you don't want to change, if you just want to stay in the same cycle, the same place that you've grown up in and lived in and you're comfortable with, um, that comfort has become an idol for you. Um, what are your idols today? Think, I want you to think about that. What are those things that God is calling you away from? God's calling you to a new life. What are the things that you just don't feel like giving up because it's just easy, it's just comfortable to keep living? What is that for you? We want comfort, I think, because we're scared. God's calling you someplace new. It's not fun to go someplace new. Um, it's, it's scary. We're not, we're not sure what it means. We're not sure how to react. We're not sure how to act. The reason we always go back to the same things is because at least, even if it's harmful, at least we know it. At least we know how to act. Um, when I, uh, got, I used to work in uh, title insurance, and title insurance for me was a terribly boring job. I, I imagine it'd be terribly boring for everyone, but maybe somebody out there likes it. For me, it was, it was a boring thing. And I remember getting laid off because it's real estate. I would get laid off every once in a while. It was another one of those cycles. Um, and I, would get laid, I remember getting laid off and, think, and just thinking, just great relief. Oh, thank goodness I don't have to <laughs> be in title insurance anymore. And then after a couple months of being laid off uh, and trying to find someplace new, nothing ever working out, I went crawling with my tail between my legs back to title insurance. Even though it was not healthy for me, it was something I, at least it was something I knew. You know, I was scared to go someplace new, but I would go back to title insurance because at least I know it. At least I know how to do it. You know, even if it's miserable, even if, it, if every single day I go into the same cubicle and I think, what am I doing here? At least I know it. And there's a comfort that comes with that. But our old life uh, will always tempt us, go back to what makes you comfortable. Our old life will also ask us, um, what has God done for you lately? There's another thing the Israelites struggled with. You know that song, well, <laughs> what's, it, what's he done for me lately? You know, oh, yeah, that was nice that he did that, but what's he done for me lately? Um, maybe that's not a song, I don't know. But the Israelites, God, God has done so many miraculous, amazing things for the Israelites. He says, I'm calling you to this promised land, and you're in slavery. I'm going to break the bondage of slavery. I'm going to take you out. Everybody that was your captives, I'm going to, you not even have to worry about them. I'm going to lead you out of here. Um, and now it took, and, and, and in the desert, I'm going to feed you and take care of you. And it took about 40 days. And then the Israelites say, well, yeah, but what has God done for me lately? God did all those things, but why, where is he now? You know, where is, we haven't even seen Moses in a long time. What's, what's he doing for us lately? We're an impatient people. If we don't have any results right away, we just give up. Well, you know, uh, your flesh will fight it unless, it unless it has something it can see. Has anybody ever tried losing weight? I don't know. Here, here. There's, when you first start to lose weight, it's great. You, the, the pounds drop off and you say, wow, you know, in the first week, people are so excited. I lost 10 pounds in the first week. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to be, you know, down to my goal in no time. But what happens your second week of weight loss? Does anybody know? You hit, that, you hit the plateau, they call it. And it's right around the second week. Second, two and a half weeks. I've, I lose weight in cycles myself, so I know. About two or three weeks in, you hit this plateau. And no matter what you do, you stay the same. And after two weeks of being in this plateau and eating vegetables and lettuce and not, you know, Big Macs or whatever, you start thinking, why in the world am I still doing this? Um, it started off well, but now I'm eating nothing, I'm starving myself, and absolutely nothing's changing because you've hit this plateau. And you don't leave the plateau, and, and it's about a couple weeks, I've noticed, at least with my body. It's a couple weeks, and then you start losing it again. But that two-week time period is a killer for anybody who's trying to be on a diet. Because for two solid weeks, you have to be doing the same things over and over again, the same disciplines, and you see no results at all. And we're impatient. We don't like that. Nobody likes to do work hard and see no results. And that plateau kills a lot of weight loss programs. But we're impatient. We get scared. We start thinking about how comforting our old life is. We start thinking about uh, all the things we could be eating. And we start wondering, you know, losing weight isn't that big of a deal for me anyway. Uh, and then we just go back to our old life. 
We do the same thing with God. God can do as many miraculous things in our life as, as possible. He can do as many miracles as he did with the Israelites as possible. And give us a span of a couple weeks, and if God doesn't show up miraculously again, we start thinking, eh, okay, well, that was nice, but, you know, what has God done for me lately? We start to give up on God. Maybe we, maybe we hide it like the Israelites did. They, they fashioned a golden calf. They went back to the things we know, and then they called it worship to God. We'll just call it that. Um, but let's be honest here. Sometimes we don't hear from God. Sometimes we go through, go through those long periods of times where we just don't hear anything. I, one, of the, one of the ways that I connect with God is I go on walk alone. <laughs> if I was with somebody, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, but I go on a walk, and, and many times it's, it's a great, it's a time of prayer and a time of just relaxing and kind of dumping everything off that I've put on my shoulders. And, you know, and sometimes it's a great experience. Sometimes it's like I come back and I think, man, I just feel God has just filled me up. I feel his strength. I feel his love. I feel his power. I come back just rejuvenated. Sometimes that happens. Many times I go on my walk and nothing happens. You know, I, I pray. I don't want to say nothing happens. I feel like nothing happens. Uh, there's no big miraculous uh, religious experience that I sometimes get. And it can be frustrating. I think you know, I keep doing it because I know that it's, it's good for me, and I know that sometimes I do feel his presence greatly, but many times, and it's, it's over 50%, I would say, I just don't. I don't get that big, you know, uh, religious experience. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous to try to manufacture that feeling because we're, you know, we're fleshly creatures. We don't, you know, for someone to say God is here with you, okay, that's great, but we want to feel it, don't we? And when I go on my walks, you know, sometimes I don't feel God, but I really do want to feel him. And it can be dangerous for us if we say, um, I really want that feeling, so I'm going to manufacture it. It can be really dangerous for us to even come into worship and say, um, I'm not feeling it today, you know, let me feel it, let me feel it, and just try to manufacture this feeling, try to manufacture an emotion. That can be really dangerous. God is present with us whether we feel it or, or whether we don't. And if we sit here and try to manufacture a feeling of it, we're going to get in trouble. We're going to start bringing in things that are harmful. Instead, we need to wait on God. But it's hard because, like I say, sometimes we don't hear from God. Sometimes we don't feel God. And I don't know why exactly God allows that to happen. Um, I wish that it didn't, honestly, if I'm being, you know, honest. I wish that any time I needed, a, you know, a wonderful, overwhelming pr feeling of the presence of God, that God would just give it to me. I wish that would happen, but he doesn't do that, and I don't know exactly why. But I think a large part of it is that he's trying to teach us to trust him, and he's trying to get us to grow with him, get, get us to grow up. A constant presence of God well, a constant presence of God, we wouldn't be able to take it. It would be completely overwhelming to us. Um, it'd be like eating, you know, steak's great. But if you ate steak, <laughs> maybe you don't like steak. But that's the first analogy that came to mind because I love steak. If you ate steak all the time, you'd start getting, it would be overwhelming. Um, there's a couple other examples I could give, but I don't know if there's kids in here. Uh, if you getting pleasurable things all the time is just overwhelming. God is not in is not desirous of that. Um, the difficult times are when we desperately need God to show up, though, and He doesn't. When we're desperately calling on Him, and it feels like it's just He's not there. And it's not like I said. It's not that He's not there. Uh, he's always there, but it's just you don't feel Him. I think in those times, God wants us to trust. And, and grow with him. I was talking with a, a friend of mine, and we were talking about what it, what, what it was like. When did we first feel like uh, we were an adult? When, when did it really first feel like we grew up? And I was asking him this because still, I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> when, when's this going to happen for me? No, I didn't, not really. Um, but I was talking with this uh, guy, and he, um, he's a mechanic. He works on cars, and he says, I remember this specifically. I was in high school, near, or maybe it was at the end of high school, somewhere in there. He says, I was working on a, a friend of mine's car, and I, had, and I had broke something. As I was in there to fix it, I had broke this piece, and I, was, and I didn't know what to do. So I went into my dad, and I said, Dad, um, I, I need your help. I really, this guy brought his car in for me, to work, and, I, and I messed up this part. I need your help. I don't know what to do. And his dad said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to help you. 
And he said, I was so angry with my dad because I didn't, I didn't have the slightest idea what to do. He said, but I, I went back into the garage and I, and, and I did everything I knew how to do and started doing things I didn't even know how to do and I worked as hard as I've ever worked before and I eventually got it working again. And he said, that moment to me was the most important moment to me in my entire life. That's when I knew that I was an adult. That's when I knew I was a man. But I could, he said, I could only feel that way if, because my dad let me fall on my own. My dad let me stumble on my own because my dad didn't come in and scoop me up and, and bail me out every single time. He said, that's when I first felt like a man. And I don't know exactly why God does it all the time, why we don't always hear from God, but I think that's a large part of it, that God is wanting us to trust him and walk with him and grow with him. And those periods of time, those, those 40 days where we don't get those religious experiences, those can be extraordinarily growing experiences because now we're walking with God even when we don't get the, the pleasures of it. Now we're walking with God and trusting him to going someplace new even when we don't know exactly what God's plan is. And that's how we grow. In those times, we don't want to manufacture a feeling and we don't want to go to something else. Uh, we want to stay waiting on the Lord, patiently trusting in him. And he will always show up. He will always show up. Like I said, he's always there anyway. It's just that we don't feel it sometimes. But I want to say that if you're in that period right now, if you're in that 40 days where you haven't heard from God, you're not sure what's going on, um, God will always show up. He will always make himself known to you. That's, that's his promise, not mine. If we say we trust in God, though, that's exactly what trust means is when we don't understand it, when we don't know what's going on, trust means uh, this is where trust can shine through. If you do understand everything completely, it's not really trust at that point. Trust means Falling, uh, waiting on him patiently even when you don't know what's going on. Here's what happens when we do wait on God when we're in those 40 days. As we wait on him, we learn to see him in ways that we never imagined. We're waiting, you're waiting on God for a feeling that maybe you felt before. Um, you're waiting him to show up maybe in ways that he always does. But when we wait on him, when we don't feel him, we learn to see him in ways that we never imagined. We begin seeing his works in more and more things that we never would have otherwise. This journey that the Israelites are taking uh, through the desert, every single day there's a, a pillar of smoke by day that guides them and a pillar of fire by night. They're seeing this every single day. Even in this period of 40 days, they're saying, well, I don't know really where God's at. Meanwhile, there's a pillar of smoke and fire here that they're not even paying attention to anymore. When we learn to wait on God, we start seeing him in those things too. And if the Israelites would have just waited, they would have said, oh, you know what, he's here. Here's the smoke. Here's the fire. He's here. He's here in all these things. Um, my, my own journey, I, from, I, I journeyed kind of from uh, atheism into belief in God. I, I, I went on a journey where I didn't see God in anything. And now God's bringing me to a place where I see him more and more in, in everything, in all things. I see him in sunsets. I see him in my kids. I see him in my family. I see him in love. I see him in when we serve. I see him uh, when I read the Bible. I see him everywhere. And God's bringing me on this journey, not because I'm special. I didn't, I was a person who didn't see God in anything. But God says, you wait on me and you'll start to see, oh, God's a lot bigger than I thought he was. I was waiting on this little thing here, but really God's wanting to show me so much more. I put there in the study guide, in the insert there, our old life will also always promise us, I will bring you comfort, but keep you. Here's the secret. Here's the little asterisk. Your old life says, I will bring you comfort, asterisk, but I'll keep you in bondage. I'll bring you comfort, but I'm going to keep you in bondage. The Israelites wanted comfort. They wanted to the worship the idols. Yeah, the old life says, right, go right back to slavery. I'm going to keep you in bondage because in bondage is comfortable. Like me in title insurance. Title insurance, it still will call me to this day. If I'm frustrated with something at church, I always think, well, maybe I ought to just go back to title insurance. And my old life is sitting back there, come back, come back. <laughs> it's comfortable here. I say, oh, the, but the cubicle. Yeah, but you know what a cubicle feels like. Uh, I'll be waiting for you, it says. No, no, I fight it. Uh, abusive relationships, the same time. Come back to this abusive relationship. It's hurtful, yes, but it's also comfortable. And that and that's a temptation to our old life, to our flesh. The problem is, you need a new, we need a new center of gravity. The psychologists, the experts will say, yeah, you're stuck. Wherever you were at seven, that's where you're going to be for the rest of your life. 
They'll say you can, pendul- you can try to pendulum swing away from it, but cycle of abuse, you're going to go right back. You're going to go right back. Like I said, it's depressing for us, but here, as, as Christ followers, we don't, we don't have to think of it in terms of a pendulum. Because a pendulum means you're, you're trying to fight against it, but eventually you're going to go back. What we have is a power greater than ourselves. Now, I had a great slide for this, but you're going to have to picture this. We need a new center of gravity. With yourself at the center of gravity, how gravity works is, like how our planets work, I don't know if you remember this from school, but the earth goes around the sun. Okay, the sun is the center of gravity. Now, us, our old life, we were the center of our own universe. We just do what we want to do. We go around ourselves. We revolve around ourselves. And here's that cycle. And we can't break it because on our old life, you're the center of gravity. And so you keep going through the same thing over and over again. The same sins over and over again. And maybe some of us are better. Maybe we have really wide orbits where there's a, there's a period of time where, hey, I haven't sinned in a long time. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. No, if you're the, the center of gravity, eventually it's going to come right around. It's called an elliptical orbit. That's what comets do. Uh, maybe you're a comet. But the problem is the same thing. You're going to come around like Halley's Comet every 75 years, and here we are in the same thing. Oh, I'm going to break it for a little bit. No, I'm going to come around. It's the cycle of abuse. Uh, the psychologists say you can't break that because you're the center of your own gravity. How are you going to have a new center of gravity? I'll tell you how. You put Jesus at the center of your life. With Jesus at the center of your life, you're no longer going around yourself, the same old sins over and over again, the same old life over and over again. With Jesus at the center, now you come around to holiness. And with yourself at the center, it brings discouragement. It brings, uh, you're tired, you're, you're burnt out because it's all around yourself. With Jesus at the center, he's the wellspring of hope, love, grace, mercy, strength. I was even, as I was preparing this message, I was tired one day when I was preparing it. And I said, oh, you know what, I'm just going to go to bed. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm, I'm talking about this. Jesus being the center of my gravity. Jesus, can you give me strength? It's strength from nowhere. Came from nowhere. Now, if it was for myself, yeah, I'm burned out. I'm going to bed. But with Jesus at the center, you have just a fountain of strength and hope and forgiveness always there for you. And when you revolve around him, it makes you stronger and stronger. And instead of falling into sin over and over again, you fall into holiness over and over again. I put there, uh, Jesus doesn't promise comfort, but he will give you freedom. The flesh will promise comfort. I'll give you comfort. Just come back to me, but I'm going to keep you in chains. Jesus says, I'm not going to promise you comfort, but I will give you freedom. Now, when I say Jesus doesn't promise comfort, Jesus is a great source of comfort. But what I mean is, God doesn't want to keep you comfortable. He doesn't want to keep you on the couch with your nachos watching Netflix. <laughs> it's, not, it's not God's intention for you. Uh, he's going to call you someplace new. He's going to call you out on the water. And it's going to be terrifying. And it's going to be scary. But if God is calling you, trust that he'll be there with you and that he's calling you to a better place. Stop living in fear. Stop living your life by whatever is the most comfortable. Stop mixing your own life, your old life, with God's new life and calling it worship. Stop doing the same things over and over again and saying, yeah, this is what it means to be a Christian. God has a new life for you. All that stuff about the pendulum, that doesn't apply to a Christ follower because we have a different center of gravity. Dads, you don't have to be like your own father if your father wasn't, didn't cut the mustard. You don't have to live like that. As a Christ follower, you can have a new center of gravity. You can live more and more like Christ. You don't have to keep being a jerk, guys, I don't know if you realize this, you can stop as a Christ follower. <laughs> uh, you say, well, that's just who I am. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, you need to have a different center of gravity. Um, you don't have to keep living in the same sins. You don't have to keep opening up the internet and looking at pornography again. That's part of your old life, but God's calling you something new. You don't have to keep falling into alcohol. You don't have to keep falling into abuse. You need a new center of gravity. As Christians, people, shouldn't, shouldn't, people should never say about us, oh, that's just how they are. That's just how he or she is. You know? As Christians, we should be shocking people all the time that we're new, that we're different, that we're acting differently than we did before. People should be shocked. Well, this isn't like you at all. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow somebody else. I'm trying to follow Jesus. I'm trying to be someone new. You should be changing more and more like Jesus, not just more and more like yourself. You shouldn't be the same person you were last year. You should be able to surprise people, like I said. Um, 
people say, yeah, that's not like you. You say, absolutely not. I'm, I'm trying not to be like me. I have a new center of gravity now. In closing, I'm going to wrap it up, Glenn. Sorry. In closing, <laughs> I want to read you a chapter from, uh, uh, well, a couple chapters from the Bible here with uh, just a small amount of commentary. This is uh, the Apostle Paul struggling with his old life versus his new life. He said, the trouble is not with the law. This is the law that God gave to Moses on the mountain. He says, the trouble is not with the law. The law is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I'm all too human. I'm a slave to sin. I don't really even understand myself for what I want to do, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Do you hear me? He's revolving around himself. I see it's the same cycle over and over again. He says, I discovered this principle in my life. When I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law, but there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. What a miserable person I am, Paul says. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Why don't you feel the weight of that problem? Who's going to free us from this pendulum, from this cycle of abuse, from the thing that the psychologists say, no, you're, that's just the way you are. Here's the next word that Paul says, and these are the greatest words in the Bible. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. And then he goes on into the next chapter, and I want to read this whole thing. So bear with me. He says, Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies that we have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. How did he do this? By giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Now listen. We no longer follow our sinful nature. We're no longer revolving around ourselves, but instead we follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Those who are controlled by the spirit think about things that please the spirit. You can talk about a different center of gravity that we ought to have. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. The sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's, God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under its control can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raises Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give your life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For you, if, if you live by its dictates, you'll die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And we call him Abba Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Amen? Let's pray.